All right, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, we thank you that you have promised us in your word that even though your son slept in the front of the ship on the Sea of Galilee, that he is never sleeping and unaware of what is happening in our lives. We pray you according to your promise to always watch over us and all of your baptized children. Keep us in the palm of your hand, and according to your will, preserve us from trials and or relieve us of them. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So that prayer doesn't have to do what we're talking about for Bible class today. That has to do more with Sunday. But anyway, so today we are going to be looking at a couple of the main early heresies that the Christian church had to deal with. The first of these, if I can turn on the keyboard, is Gnosticism. Now this picture here, by the way, I actually couldn't tell you what it specifically stands for, except I Google image search Gnosticism, and this super trippy picture came up. And so, no, Vicky, it's okay because it really doesn't come through that loud. Vicky, the sound is okay because the microphone is pointing towards me. Okay. So, like on the other videos of Bible classes, like the kids, you can kind of tell something's going on, but it's not the dominant sound. And it's, it's yeah. my hearing aids. I'll take them mm -hmm. out. But the thing which I can tell you about this picture is that it definitely conveys the idea that having some secret knowledge opens up the gateway to you for peace. And that is an emphasis of Gnosticism. So, in Gnosticism, some of the main points is the idea of physical versus spiritual. In Gnosticism, physical is bad, spiritual is good. And so in this way, it has a lot to do with Buddhism, right? Because in Buddhism, the idea is to achieve nirvana through detachment from all physical things. Which is why, as we talked about in the ladies' study last month, you wouldn't want to go to a hospital and see a statue of Buddha on the wall. You want to go to a hospital and see a crucifix on the wall, if the hospital has any kind of religious connection. And the reason is because you would much rather have the motivating factor behind your physical medical care be God's incarnational concern for the world and him making our tangible physical problems his own on the cross versus detachment from all cares and connections. Right? Go ahead. IMCs, I was at the hospital yesterday, IMCs the chapels are now, they're starting to call them meditation rooms. Oh yeah, they're super vague, right? Yeah. Like maybe they have a picture of like a very, very artistic dove. I didn't go in, but... Yeah. I mean, I remember one nice thing about the Mayo Clinic, where I was for a time in Minnesota, is they didn't have a meditation room. They had an actual big Catholic church connected to the hospital. Because the Mayo Clinic, at least the, the St. Mary's Hospital have, is still owned by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Winona, I believe. Not like you know where Winona is, but it's part of that thing. Okay. So, yeah, but these things, of course, become more and more vague. And especially in Utah. I mean, because you probably rather see nothing than a picture of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith. It's like, that, there's not a lot of comfort for you either. Yes, Jim? Can you kind of explain what that picture is? is trying to convey well I think you'll get it as we talk through these points okay. and if you don't then we'll just say wow look at that trippy picture <laughs> so for Gnosticism physical is bad spiritual is good and this impacts how they understand the creation of the world that they believe that or the Gnosticism believed I mean it's not like this living you can see traits of Gnosticism in society and religion all the time but there's not a Gnostic church it's not this organized thing. But the Gnostic idea is that um, there were originally these, the number is not sure, but these great spiritual beings. And one of them went bad and created the physical world. Um, and so trapping people in a physical body and a physical earth. However, because that creator eon 
was a spiritual being, it also gave people a spiritual sense. And the whole goal then is to be saved from physical creation so that you can just achieve a spiritual reality as opposed to a physical one. And so it kind of has elements, again, of nirvana, if that makes sense. Now, can you achieve pure salvation during this life? No. But you can be freed from all things after death. Now, the nature of salvation we talked about. So Gnosticism, it did not originate as a Christian heresy. It was actually just a general idea. But as Christianity spread... It came into contact with Gnostics and Gnosticism. And there were certain elements of Christianity they liked, and so they tried to blend the two through syncretism, which is always a bad idea. So, in the Christian version of Gnosticism, Jesus is the messenger who was sent into the world to give the secret knowledge through which you can know the truth and be set free to use his terminology, but being set free doesn't have to do so much with sin and guilt and damnation. It has to do with being set from things that are physical. Also, they would distinguish between Jesus and Christ, by the way. Not necessarily in a uniform way, but Christ was this um, the spiritual person, and Jesus... He had kind of a physical nature, but not necessarily, because they rejected the incarnation, and especially they rejected the birth. Because if you are born, then that means that you have been subjected to the futility and the evil of creation. Therefore, Jesus could not have been born, and they did not like the idea of Jesus actually having a, a true human nature and body. And this comes up in this idea called docetism. It was an ancient heresy that was related to Gnosticism. Gnosticism. And docetism taught that even though Jesus looked like a man, he wasn't one. It was just a facade. Jim, go ahead. And then, where did God fit into it? Or did he? If God he the Father would have been one of these great spiritual beings who sent Christ to save us people who are crippled and imprisoned in physical things. It's kind of like with the Greek and Roman gods. They're sitting up here. Yeah. They're, honestly. It's similar. Okay. Um, so, now did Jesus have a true physical human nature and body? When are some times during his life in the Gospels that we see this especially brought out. When he cries. So he wept, mm -hmm. so he had human emotions. Mm -hmm. What else? He, he bled. bled. He, bled. On the... he bled. What were you going to say? That's what I... Yeah. Also, a little more simply, he, he fell asleep when he was tired. So he had the same kind of physical body that you do and during his earthly life during his time of humiliation, he had the same physical needs that you do. So when he got hungry, he would eat. When he ever got thirsty, he would drink. When he would get tired after preaching and performing miracles, basically nonstop for days on end, he would fall asleep just in a heap in the front of a boat on the Sea of Galilee and remain asleep even while there was a storm raging. So, kind of hint what you're going to hear in a little bit. Now, so, in Gnosticism, you can tell that it's definitely just a spiritual ideal. And you can see this in modern times, too, when people talk about, well, I'm a spiritual person, I'm not religion, I'm not religious. To which our reply would be, oh, so you worship the devil, because the devil and his demons, they are spirits. But you don't want to worship them, we don't believe in them. Um, and there, there's this question, then, what does your body have? What does your body have? And there were two different ways of answering the question, how to treat the hermit, the human body. The first was called asceticism. And this was the idea that in order to achieve true spiritual life, you would control your body, exercising self-control, avoiding physically, ple physically pleasurable things. 
So it almost might have a monastic look to us, but not with the same motivation. So you would be very healthy, not smoke, drink, all that kind of stuff. You would also have the totally opposite idea called libertinism. And this was the idea that since only the spirit matters, let the body do what it wants because it doesn't matter anyway. So, now we'd probably say that asceticism would be more the Christianized answer for Gnosticism compared to libertinism, but you would find both things. Um, make sense? Any questions on this? How well spread was this, or how well, or was it just a fringe element? I mean, Gnosticism was a widespread belief. I couldn't tell you if there were certain places where it would be more or less popular. It would have been less popular in Jew in Israel, for sure. Yeah. So this 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 would have been encountered more in the rest of the Roman world. I would assume Greece, uh, but I couldn't really give you a firm answer beyond okay, that. Okay, I'm just wondering among the Christians how. So now you can see then how this uh, would make sense. That you'd have this, 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 this creator giving you like the true wisdom in the head and it opens the gate for you so that you can see past the created world into true spiritual peace. Does that make sense now? I think it's still just trippy, but that's kind of what it means. Like, you, like, if I came over to your house and you had this poster on your wall, this would be the topic of conversation. Why? Tell me, tell me about this. Why do you own this? Why would you want to have this? All right, now, how did Christianity answer this? Well, one answer is very direct. We hear it every single Christmas on church, or at least the five or six people who come to church on Christmas Day and not this Christmas Eve hear this answer. John's Gospel begins, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John's Gospel emphasizes very heavily the physical, incarnational nature, the human, the human nature of Jesus. And a lot, of the a lot of the miracles that only John's Gospel tells us about, like the wedding of Cana, for example, emphasizes Jesus' humanity and his concern for physical things. Make sense? And we also then have the canon of Scripture. Because one of the Gnostic things is that in addition to reimagining and reinterpreting the actual books of the Bible, kind of trying to read between the lines or picking and choosing to, to get their desired outcome, they would also have these other books that were falsely attributed to some biblical figure. And so a very common one was they claimed to have this supposed Gospel of Thomas, um, which is not a thing. But the Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic book which puts words into Jesus' mouth, basically having him be a proponent of Gnosticism. And the claim was, well, the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they got the story wrong. Jesus only told the secret knowledge to Thomas, right? So this also has elements of like this, um, this intellectual elitism going on. Or also conspiracy theories of too, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, the same thing doesn't it go with, I've heard it said that uh, Judas was actually, Jesus told him what. Yeah, that would be another idea. Yeah. Basically, any non-Christian book in these times would have had elements of Gnosticism. Um, so in response to this, the Christian church started to more firmly establish what is called the canon of Scripture. Because it certainly is not that after Pentecost, the first thing that, that, is, that the apostles did was sit down and write all the books which comprise the New Testament. This happened gradually and it all and it began to happen decades after the mission of the early church began before it was all word of mouth and so if you were at 
a church in a city in the ancient world in the you know 150s AD, you probably did not have all four Gospels. Maybe you had one or two. You definitely would have one. You'd have, you'd have at least one account of the story of Christ. Maybe you would have some of the epistles as well, the letters. And so Christians began to communicate, well, what do you have? What do you have? Trying to establish what do we actually believe are the holy books that God has given to us, which convey the gospel of Jesus being, uh, well, the true. The, well, how, what about, what's the word I'm looking for? That Jesus actually creating the gospel through his life, death, and resurrection, and his, his story, and then the apostles shepherding the New Testament church. Another thing which the early church did was it developed the creeds. Sometimes these are called the symbols of faith. Sometimes they're called the ecumenical creeds. What ecumenical means in this context is universal. So an ecumenical creed would be something which all Christians should be able to um, profess. And if you're not willing to profess what this creed says, then you're not a Christian. Now, the Apostles' Creed, it appeared in a, a pretty close to modern form already in 150 AD. That's pretty old. It was not, however, originally written as a creed that was had the purpose of being confessed in church like we use it today, but it was written as a baptismal confession. So before someone was baptized, they would ask them, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And kind of like how we still use the creed in our baptism rites today, too. Yes. Is it kind of more like a, an outline or a guide? Yeah. When the the when uh, new members or when whatever that they understand these points yeah. and agree with these points. Yes. Yeah. And in that way, we do, or at least we should, still follow the model and the structure of the creeds as we catechize people who are new to the Christian faith today. You know, the kids learn that in um, their classes, their catechism classes. Or, yeah. And when Jordan was in high school, they were talking about religion in one of his worldview classes. Yeah. And they were talking about the creed. Mm -hmm. And Jordan told his teacher, I know that. And he recited it, boom, right in class. And she told us that parent-teacher, I'll never forget it. She goes, he knows it. He knows it. And I said, well, of course he does. Back then, I took the kids to church every week. Yeah. So, one of the, I mean, this is one of the reasons why creeds are useful. Mm -hmm. It's not just to weed out ancient heretics. The primary reason why creeds are useful is because if you are taught this over and over again, then it's stuck in your head. You can't get it out. Right. Even if some people try. <laughs> I've known people who have lived a time in their life where it looked like they were trying to get rid of the creed, but then when they returned to the faith, they still had it memorized. And it was one of the things through which God worked to bring them back to the faith. And it's the same rationale for why the church and all its members benefit from consistent, traditional liturgical worship. Because even the pre-readers in our church, if you offered them candy or a poly pocket, or screen time, they could probably actually rattle off the entire ordinary of the liturgy, probably singing it better than speaking it. Because again, music teaches, and it, it cements something in your mind better than just spoken words. Yeah. Yes. Is there a song? Because I learned uh, Bible work. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Yeah, Genesis, so Exodus, Leviticus. Well, yeah, I have a different tune. Yeah, but, you have the wrong one, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> but there should be one for the, at least the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed yeah. is harder. Oh, to sing the creed? Yeah, to sing, is there a song? If so there, there actually is a resource that Concordia Publishing House came out with called uh -huh. Singing the Catechism, oh. or called Singing the Faith, but it's uh -huh. the entire okay. small catechism put to song. Oh. And Marta has it, and she sometimes teaches the kids the different parts of that. Oh, so, so actually, yes. Yeah. So, but so, um, yeah. I mean, I would say that what the, the you weren't here last Sunday, but last Sunday we followed the chorale service. Now, 
Some people consider the chorale service to be the hard liturgy that they'd rather pastor not use. Um, which was fitting then, because I used it last Sunday when I was still deliberating the call to Wisconsin. So idea, a, a joking idea in the back of my head was, oh, well, I'll use the chorale service. That way the law won't make a leave. Um, but the benefit of the chorale service is that um, the creed, for example, instead of saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, it goes... We all believe in one true God. And the more you use it and the more you sing it, the more you actually know it. Yeah. So, it's probably not exactly what you were yeah, referencing, but, but these things do exist as catechetical tools. Yeah. And the thing is, some of these catechetical tools are part of the regular worship of the church. Because the church worship teaches you the faith. In fact, it teaches you the faith better than just reading it in the book does. Now, but let's get into some of the specifics in the Apostles' Creed. So we confess in the Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty. The original word is pantocrator, which we translate as Almighty, but actually a more literal translation is all ruling. So you believe in God the Father who rules all things. And that would include physical things too. So that God is in charge of and is over all these things, not just spiritual matters. Also, the Apostles' Creed says that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Now, as we look at Martianism in a little bit, we'll also see that that's an important phrase, too, for a different reason. I know, Martianism, right? Martian, I was going to say what? <laughs> so, but the fact is that Gnostics did not want the, they did not like the idea that Jesus was bound and part of creation like we are. The whole point is he's saving us from this. And so that's why the creed says he was born. It leans in and puts all of its weight on the incarnation and birth of Jesus. And then also it says he was crucified, died, buried, and rose again. All things which emphasize the human nature of Jesus, not just the spiritual. Yes, Jim? No, what I was saying about born of Virgin Mary, it was, I mean, so... They totally reject that God specifically put his son. Yeah, in human that, form. that a good a good God would never have his son be born. That's the Gnostic idea. And so the Christian church says, well, actually, Jesus was born. And this is one of the and foundational was, tenets of our it faith. It was intentional. Yes. It was intentional. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Christian Church, the Gnostic movement was not well organized. It was very individualized. Like, you did not need a pastor to do this. You were actually better off being totally untethered from all pastoral authority and theological tradition so you could read the Bible and come up with whatever wacky, individualized, purely spiritual um, ideas that you wanted. Like people do today. Like people do today. When people say, I'm spiritual, not religious. Yeah. And it's like, well, you're not the first one who has said that. Yeah. So, let's move on to Martianism then. That's what you think of Martianism, right? <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. This is Martianism. This is a depiction of, Mar of Martian. So, Martian... He was someone who was actually raised a Christian. He was the son of a pastor. However, as he became older, he developed some Gnostic leanings, including especially that the physical world is evil, and also a definite antipathy towards Judaism, which came out then in his version of Christianity. So, one of the central ideas for this is the world is evil, therefore... So is the God who created the world. And so Martian, he was a, basically, it was kind of polytheism. Because he believed that Jehovah, who was the God of the Old Testament, to whom the creation of the world is ascribed, who chose Abraham as the father of his specific nation, he is not the same as God the Father. The Jehovah in the Old Testament is an arbitrary God who picks and chooses some people without any reason and is hyper-concerned with judgment and condemnation. God the Father, who is the Father of Jesus, he is a good, loving God who does not pick and choose, 
who does not condemn. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So God the Father never chose the Jews. Only Jehovah did. And then how do you think this impacts the Old Testament versus the New Testament? Martian totally rejected the entire Old Testament as Jewish fables and myths. It kind of sounds like the German National Church under Nazism, where if you don't like Judaism, well, you're going to have to make some changes to Christianity, right? But in addition to rejecting the entire Old Testament, Martian also rejected Matthew, Mark, and John. Those, in his opinion, were the most Jewish Gospels. He only held to Luke's Gospel because he believed it was the least Jewish one, to which we say, well, maybe, but you're splitting hairs. And also, Martian, he really, um, he, he, he put the greatest emphasis on Pauline's, on the Pauline epistles, that the letters of Paul, those were what really um, conveyed true Christianity, because after all, Paul had been taught by Jesus in the wilderness from three years apart from the disciples. Even though we would say the reason why he was taught for three years was because the disciples were. But, um, so that's one textual difference. And now we talked about in the Creed that the Creed confesses that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Martian did not want Jesus to be born of Mary. It wasn't so much a hatred of physical things even though Martian did have that kind of same spiritual emphasis, but he didn't want her to be born of Mary because that would make Jesus a Jew. And so what Martian taught is that Jesus just kind of appeared during the reign of Tiberius, which is ironic given his choice of Luke as his preferred gospel because only Luke's gospel goes into the nitty-gritty of the conception and birth of Jesus from the woman's perspective. Like, John's gospel has this poetic stuff about the word became flesh, and then we go right into John the Baptist. But anyway, um, so the Martian canon, I kind of already talked about this, was Luke's gospel and the Pauline epistles, and that was it. And so it was not a Jewish faith. It was, it was against that. And so how did the church respond to, to Martianism? And it wasn't with that song, from the movie Mars Attacks. It was this. So, interestingly, Martianism, it posed a greater long-term threat to Christianity than Gnosticism did. Because again, Gnosticism was this individualized, kind of decentralized movement, whereas Martianism, it actually became an organized religion with an ecclesiastical structure, and it existed in at least some form for centuries. So it was a long-term problem for Christianity. Um, in answer to the Martianism, Martianism as well, this motivated the early Christian church to solidify what is the canon. So what, what are the scriptures? And it united the church that wasn't Martian around the idea that we believe Jesus is the promised son of David. We hold to the Old Testament and the New Testament as the inspired word of God. Now, in response to Martianism during Martian's life, did the church establish the canon? No, this was only done with finality at the Council of Nicaea in 325, which we will talk about in the coming weeks. Um, but in the meantime, the church did emphasize they accepted all four of the Gospels, even with their supposed differences and emphases. So we have, in the past in Bible class, we've looked at how the, the Gospels compare when it comes to the institution of the Lord's Supper and the resurrection of Jesus, right? To show that they don't all say things in exactly the same way. And so it's kind of like if, if all of you were at different points on an intersection and you saw a car accident and the cop asked you, what happened? I think that all four of you, if you weren't looking at your phone, you would get the basic facts right. The red car hit the blue car. But you wouldn't get all the tidbits right. Maybe Jim would say the blue car ran the red light at 352, and the blue car hit it, and it was the red car's fault. And Marsha would say the blue car hit the red car. 
Like there'd be more more focus and less focus. And so it's kind of like that too, that the gospels have different focuses and emphases so that if you look at them, you get the same story. And especially for the most important things in the gospels, like the institution of the Lord's Supper or the account of the resurrection, even though if you look at them, you see they don't actually disagree, but they do have a different perspective. And it actually makes them hold up better um, in the eyes of like um, reason compared to if all of a sudden they use the exact same verbiage, which would give the impression someone must have gotten together and make sure we have our story straight. Yes, Jim? During this time, you said that uh, this uh, had a big following, had its own clergy, had that. Well, I didn't say how big it was, but well, they had their they own had ecclesiastical their own structure. Okay. Did, was there any ever debates between the early church, the Christian church, and these? Well, there would have been debates and arguments, and there would have been situations where um, you would have Martian, Martianites, um, would be turning in Christians to the Roman authorities. Because remember uh, yeah. that um, the way it kind of settled in in the Roman Empire was that Christianity was, Christianity was illegal if you got caught. If you minded your own business and you were not turned in for Christianity, then you were left alone. But if you were turned in, then the law code obligated the Romans to prosecute you to the full extent of the law. And so there is proof in the early church, or at least hints, that some of the 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 foremost most famous theologians who were martyred, the reason why they were martyred is because they were turned in by heretics, which is sleazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, accepting all the gospels, differences and all, and then in the Apostles' Creed, they emphasized born of Mary. So it's the same statement, but with a different importance. And then also saying that Jesus was going to return to judge the living and the dead. Remember, Jehovah likes judgment. God the Father, who is a different God, does not. And so, as the Christian church would confess that Jesus is going to return, emphasizing that he is the only Savior of the world, he is going to judge the world. It's not some universalistic thing that's totally devoid of judgment. And then also one other way that the Christian church answered this was um, remember how St. Paul describes Peter, James, um, and John, that they were the pillars of the early Christian church, and that Jesus did not just, it wasn't just one apostle, it was not just one gospel, but it was the holy apostolic faith. I think that yeah, the Bible says it built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the, and the apostles, right? Mm -hmm. I forget, is that the last slide for today? It is the last slide. And we're almost done. So those were a couple of the main early Christian heresies, or the early heresies that the Christian church had to answer. There were also other ones as well. Some of these heresies were just ways in which the Christian church like individual congregations or areas of Christians would fall prey to serious errors. So we know, for example, that St. Paul had to deal with these. The influence of the Judaizers was so great in modern-day Turkey that he had to write the epistle, epistle to the Galatians, which was part of Turkey. And in that, he taught them, no, you cannot require that Gentile converts must submit to circumcision and keep the rest of the Old Testament ceremonial law, even though this was an early Christian era. And then you would also have what was going on in Corinth, where the Corinthians were totally messed up, both when it came to how they would celebrate the Lord's Supper and worship in particular. So, the Christian church, because it is populated by sinful people, has never had a time when it was totally pure and devoid of um, falsehood that needed to be corrected. So we should not have this idea that during the time of the apostles, everything was perfect. I mean, St. John, he was already having to emphasize the human nature of Jesus against Gnosticism while he was still alive. He knew Jesus. <laughs> yes, Jim. 
during that time, like the apostles, I mean, they would be invited in certain towns and whatever to speak. Is that how? Well, sometimes, would, sometimes a Christian community in a town would like send a letter to Paul, for example, please come teach us. Um, and sometimes he was able to go, and sometimes he was not. And so, off the top of my head, Romans was written to the Christians in Rome because Paul couldn't go then, so he wrote it as a general doctrinal book, which is why Romans is so useful for us, because it wasn't written to deal with a certain problem. It was just written to teach Christians. Um, but then other times, like Paul tells us that he would be given guidance in a dream about where he should or should not go. So, it just depended. And then for a lot of the apostles, they disappear from history. We don't, we don't show up anymore, even though we know that they went and carried out the Great Commission somewhere. For some of them, the tradition about where that is is stronger or weaker than others. So, hopefully the best things you remember today are the trippy Gnostic coaster and the New Mars attacks. And the Martian. Yes, the Martians. Yeah, that was so, a cute slide. We will stop here and pick up. Not next time. <laughs>